actually like i've seen professors who want you to maybe contact their postdoc students so that you can work under them instead of directly under the professor as well because they might be busy or something that also can work out and some like professors have like very well structured processes of getting into their lab where they have like tasks you need to do and- hello everyone welcome back to my channel where we dive deep into the world of machine learning research and career growth Today I have a very special guest with me Srija Mukhopadhyay and she's an amazing machine learning researcher who has been doing some incredible work in the field. We'll be talking about her research journey, how she started, her approach to finding professors to work with and the outcomes of her work so far. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. Hi Srija, thank you so much for joining us today. I am super excited to hear about your journey and the amazing work that you have been doing in machine learning research. Can you give a short introduction of yourself? Uh Hello, I'm Srija. I'm a fourth year dual degree student studying at Triple IIT Hyderabad, where I am doing a B.Tech in computer science as well as a master's in computational linguistics. Uh, my master's degree is what got me into research because in Triple IIT we have to like work with professors and labs and stuff. But apart from research, I am also like uh, upcoming SWE intern in Google, where I have interned for the past two years as well. Great. So, so why did you choose like computational linguistics for research? Uh, so the story is kind of interesting. It's like there's this linguistics Olympiad called the Panini Linguistics Olympiad, which got me very interested in languages and how there are like patterns in various languages and identifying these patterns, which led me to the question of how do machines identify these patterns? And I found this program in triple it about like computational linguistics and i thought that was a perfect fit for me i see so it's sort of like masters uh, minor in computational linguistics it's a masters degree so i get two degrees one of them is a masters in computational linguistics so it's 5 years or 4 years yeah it's a 5 year 5, five years got it yeah. okay so let's start with your research so can you tell us a little bit of the work that you have been doing? So what's the focus of your research and what inspired you to dive into this area? Yeah, sure. So uh, I've always been broadly interested in like natural language processing since I like got to know about the patterns in languages. And uh, th- that led me to wanting to pursue research in NLP, which eventually led me to like get involved in understanding how LLMs work and all. Uh, so the work I've been, the research I've been doing till now has mostly been about uh, understanding how VLMs or visual language models work. Uh, I have been investigating how question answering systems work through VLMs and how robust these models are in understanding or deciphering the content that we give them or how good it is at answering different modalities. So like graphs or images of charts, images of maps, things like those. And apart from that, currently what I'm interested in and what I'm working on is interpretability, where I'm trying to investigate methods of like unlearning and VLMs and also like how the representations of models change and evolve when we train models. Got it. So so you must be knowing about when 2.5 VL model. Yeah. So that is like a new thing, right? So that is also um, based on this only. So Quen 2.5 is actually a really good model. I think among the open source models, it is definitely the best model, like especially the bigger Quen models. It's really, really good. And mm-hmm. I think recently I was testing it out on something and it did really well, like better than Gemini and GPT in a few tasks. So like it's a really good model. Yeah. Quen, I, I've also used it. So I, I'm also going to like get out a fine tuning task on that like project. I was working on that. So I saw that it was really good actually for mine too. It's insanely good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. So research like can be a very long and challenging process, right? So can you walk us through how you approach this work? So what was the ex- exactly the goal? Like I saw there are three internships, I think, right, that you're working on. And like, can you go through them? Like, uh, what is the work and what are the key steps overall in those research? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I am working on like with three different professors for research. One is, uh, as I told that in our college, we have to work with a professor or lab 
as a part of our dual degree requirement. So there I'm working with Professor Manish Shivastava, who is from IIIT, and I'm working on uh, how, like, how what is the similarity between, say, the base version of a model versus the fine-tuned version of a model, and how models evolve when they find when we fine-tune it. So model similarity as a whole. Apart from that, so the second project I'm working with Professor Vivek Gupta from Arizona State University. And this is more about like how VLMs perform in visual question answering tasks. So how good they are or how robust they are for understanding different kinds of charts or different kinds of maps. And finally, recently I started working with Professor Ponurangam Kumar Guru from IIIT again. And this is the AI safety interpretability side of things where I'm exploring sort of how unlearning works in models or what are the ways in which we can improve interpretability methods. Got it. So this is along with your academics? Yeah. So one is a mandatory requirement for my degree. One is an independent study. So I do get grades for that with okay. Pro Professor Pern PK. And then uh, finally, one is just a collaboration I wanted to work on. Nice. So that like takes up a lot of time for you, right? Yeah. I mean, it does, but at the same time, I think at this point, I'm kind of used to it because I've been doing it for a year now. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So now I know like, like a lot of people are very curious about how to find and approach professors for research opportunities. So can you share how you connected with your professor um, and got started on these projects? Yeah, so... Uh, I think in our college, the process is made very simple because there are a lot, like in most colleges, right? There are a lot of professors who are per, like pursuing research on some domain or the other. So the easiest way to connect with professors is probably like writing a mail to one of those professors or like scheduling a meeting with them. But when it comes to collaborating with people from outside, I think uh one thing that helps a lot is having some mutual connection so the way i got to know about the external collaborator vivek gupta was through another batchmate who knew him so i just connected via him and apart from that what i've realized is uh, a lot of professors are actually very willing to work like they always have some postdocs or phd students who can help you with the project so mailing professors like just finding professors who are working in the domains you're interested in and then writing a mail to them or maybe people in their lab has always like been very helpful from what I've seen. Got it. So the um, Arizona State University one, you just connected through your friend. Yeah, so the person was actually a postdoc when I connected with him. He recently okay. got promoted, like became a professor at ASU. Got it. And the other one, like, uh, independent study one is from your college only same yeah it's from my college got it and in general like so you just have to do a cold mailing for the professor if somebody's interested suppose yeah so cold mailing helps uh again if you know someone like if you find a mutual connection that is amazing but also some professors actually like i've seen professors who want you to maybe contact their postdoc students so that you can work under them instead of directly under the professor as well because they might be too busy or something that also can work out and some like professors have like very well structured processes of getting into their lab where they have like tasks you need to do and after doing the task you can just reach out to them with the results you got this things assignment kind of yeah sort of got it so this arizona state university one that is paid or is it like normal um, research yeah. it's normal collaboration there's no payment so what's the difference like, uh, it, sorry like what's the difference between collaboration and um asking professors to work under them i mean it's the same thing it's just like a collaborative project so it's not a research internship per se where you get paid or like something in return it's just a collaboration where you just work with them get advice from them so do you like also check out from the QS rankings uh, which university is best and then try to reach out? So not really. So uh, currently I am sort of in the process of reaching out to people and 
my process has mostly been like finding people who are working in this field and like working on topics i am interested in and i don't necessarily like check qs rankings or anything because i believe like if the advisor is good enough it will be, like they might not be from the best university but if it is a good advisor it's a good advisor got it got it okay so yeah so once so yeah so i mean will will you talk about like the project in some more detail like what were the results and how long have you been working on that did you achieve what you set out to do sort of how, what what would you say is the goal of this of the research in general so that it's very open ended right yeah so uh, that was actually a question i had when i started like researching in uh, my third year which was for a long time for almost a semester i was very confused about like how do you do this research thing like it it's such a scary thing because it is told as oh i'm doing research and it's such a scary thing but what i realized eventually at least right now is that uh, research has become a very approachable with the help of llms and stuff so now it is very easy to say if you want to do literature if you want to read up on what has been done in the field you can probably like search in some like gemini or gpt and it will probably give you a list of papers with citations and stuff uh, but when i started out what really helped me i think was uh, having sort of small groups so like instead of having my problem statement as i want to achieve this and i want to publish this it was like let's explore how a model does on complex or simple questions and like building up complexity based on results at each step instead of having like a definite goal we needed to prove uh, so i'll give you an example with the work i had like my first paper that got published it was about understanding how robust vlms are for chart question answer now when we say robust it's like when we have a table we can represent it as different kinds of charts it can be a bar graph it can be a line graph anything really and for a human these won't really make a difference like if you give me a line graph versus a bar graph i would probably like give you the same results for what is the highest value what is the lowest value things like that but for llms the hypothesis was that it makes a difference and initially the way we tried to test it we got like results which did not make sense at all and that's when we took a step back and we looked at the data sets and we saw okay the data set has two parts one part is synthetic in synthetic the models perform very well because that is the kind of training they get so things like those so i think uh, uh, one important thing is how things might not go as per plan but it is also like essential to like take a step back and instead of blindly trying to pursue the goal you are going towards yeah so what was the like final result of that oh the final thing was they are not robust so we showed how even like very big models like gpt were not robust at all so even like when you change from a bar graph to a line graph or change the colors of your graphs and things like those changed font size even these small things that you would like as a person designing a chart you wouldn't really care about you would might keep all of them as default values these things affected the model performance as a lot so one thing that i found interesting and i do try to keep in mind now is like when i'm designing charts if i want an llm to interpret it i design it in a way that it's easier for every llm to understand like annotate it give big font bold colors things like this so what's the difference like what would you say is the best way so uh, a few things we found out was definitely like if you annotate it, it's obviously easy because you have numbers written next to like every bar or thing so it's easier for humans as well but things we found out was like placing the legend at a place so like at the left corner is better or and we also found out things like uh, bigger fonts are obviously something that makes a difference things like uh, horizontal bars are very bad for models they are never able to like answer well on those so keep your bars vertical i guess and things like those it was just a bunch of oh, we also found out something very cool which showed like to an extent data contamination where we gave models a blank image and the question and it was able to answer the question correctly 
but the question yeah that's very funny because you would expect they don't do that but they were able to do that which also to an extent like one of our weaker hypotheses or conclusions was that uh, maybe there is data contamination happening so better evaluation benchmarks is also a necessity i guess mm -hmm. it just goes inside its already trained data and then gives the answer yeah that's what so there's the Nobel Prize winner, right? This year, uh, last year that came out, they were talking about like AI is very like unsafe, and we have to see how we're going to use it. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So AI safety is something I have been interested in since I started research, but I think I have started to actively work on it right now. And the reason I got interested in it is because. Uh, it's like till now a lot of why LLMs work so well or how does it like how has it it how has it gotten so good that I can give it a like an instruction and it can code up an entire website for me or like make a video for me is like very unknown like people just say it works but why does it work we don't really know so it is something that like piqued my curiosity and uh, I think it's overall like I don't really see AI as, as very dangerous systems, but at the same time, it's if it's unknown, it's also good to know the capabilities before we like deploy it for everything in the real world. So I think that is important right now for sure. So I have one question though, like uh, how did you start learning about LLMs and NLP from college courses? Would you recommend any courses? Uh, so, uh, LLMs and NLP to an extent from college courses, but at the same time, uh, I was interested in it because of the linguistics Olympiad. So I like used to read up a bit of about these. Uh, if I want to like recommend a course, is one very good course is uh, Stanford's um, Natural Language Processing with Deep Learning. I think it's CS two two four N. Not sure, but it's a really really good course. Like gets you started. Tell and has like so what I've seen benefits a lot of people is like hands on experience. So this course I think includes a lot of exercises and assignments you can follow along, which is very good. Sounds good. Okay, so I see. So um, so now for like those who are watching this video who might want to follow in your footsteps. Can you share how you generally apply like, any kind of tips for students or professionals who is looking to get started? Yeah, uh, I think one very important thing to, so there are a few things. One is, this is a thing I need to remind myself from time to time, which is like, there will be times when things don't go as per plan, that like your experiments aren't giving the results you want things are uh, going haywire, like the results are not adding up, some things like those will happen. But I think it is very essential at that time to like take a step back and look at what is happening. And then another thing is just like getting started. I feel a lot of times, I at least for me, I have ended up procrastinating because it doesn't, it never feels like you have a very good idea. Like you might always want to enhance your idea and try to make it better. But one thing I realized is even if you start with a very basic idea, which maybe not like maybe done by other people, I think getting your hands dirty and getting to the execution part also leads you to getting better ideas because it's a loop where you give, get feedback from the work you're doing and then going back at it. So I think one very important thing is not procrastinating too much on getting the perfect idea, but getting your hands dirty and like starting work for that. Got it. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you again, Srija, for joining us today. I think that wraps up all my questions. And to all our viewers, if you found this video helpful, do like, subscribe, and comment. And yeah, I'll share whatever resources she mentioned in the description as well. Thank you, Srija, for your time. Thank you. Okay.